Uh, this is a truly significant partnership for Wellington. Uh, the businesses that are attached to all three organisations have massive potential to be able to drive forward the economic growth and prosperity of our city, and the three organisations should be extremely proud of the collaboration. Although, having experienced the lobbying and inquisition of all three organisations over the years, I think I need to be very careful what I wish for if you all come at me at once. Uh, today, I want to take the opportunity to talk about where the New Zealand economy is at as we put Budget 2022 together and highlight the course that we are charting through our economic plan to take it forward. Budget 2022 is being delivered in uncertain and volatile times, and it does seem, yes, like I've said that every year that I have been standing here as Minister of Finance. I promise you it's not me. Uh, but this is uh, a budget being delivered still um, in the shadow of COVID-19, and if that were not enough, we now have highly elevated global inflation, exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, which is driving significant cost of living pressures for businesses and households alike. It's tough going for many people, and after two years of COVID, that's even more keenly felt. And despite my fervent hope that the word COVID would not feature so much in my vocabulary this year, the pandemic remains ever present. We've managed to protect New Zealand from the impacts of the deadly earlier variants, and through vaccination, testing, and continuing public health measures, we are in a better position than most countries to deal with an Omicron outbreak. But it's still not easy, and like you, I'm well and truly over it. However, as we navigate this challenging time, I do think it's important not to lose sight of what we've achieved together in the face of this extraordinary shock. Our health and economic response is among the best in the world. And this is recognised as such by the major credit rating agencies, by the IMF and the OECD, to name just a few. Through COVID, the New Zealand economy suffered the single biggest hit to GDP on record, but it's now 3.5 per cent above its pre-crisis level. At the time I was presenting the budget in 2020, Treasury forecasted that unemployment would get close to 10 per cent within a short period of time. As we know, unemployment peaked at just on 5.3 per cent. New Zealand took a total of six quarters to return to its pre-crisis level of, un of employment, a year and a half. By way of comparison, following the GFC, unemployment in New Zealand remained elevated across a decade. Now, our, our response didn't happen by accident. It happened because we put in place policies like the wage subsidy that kept Kiwis in work, and because businesses and workers stepped up and battled through. In the last two quarters, unemployment has been at 3.2 per cent, the equal lowest rate on record. The Māori unemployment rate has declined from a peak of 9.1 per cent to its current level of 6.3 per cent. Pacific unemployment peaked at 10.4 per cent and now sits at 6.7 per cent. Now, actually, these rates are still too high, and there remains much more to be done to give all New Zealanders the opportunity and dignity that comes with work. But the strength of our economic recovery has meant that sections of our population are seeing opportunities in the labour market in a way that they haven't done for decades. Other economic indicators show that we're in a strong position. Our GDP is up 5.6 per cent from the same time last year. We have used our balance sheet to support the economy through the pandemic. However, our Obergale deficit for the nine months to the end of March was $8.1 billion, $4.1 billion lower than what was forecast at the half-year economic and fiscal update in December 2021. And we are now forecast to reach a surplus in 2024-25. This will be five years after COVID began, compared with the six years it took to get there after the GFC. Our debt is set to peak at about half of Australia's, around a third of that in the UK, and around a fifth of the United States, based on comparable measures. So as a result of New Zealanders' hard work and our health-led response, we are now in a strong position to face our latest set of hurdles, but also importantly deal with the long-term challenges and opportunities that New Zealand has put in the too hard basket for too long. The short-term challenge of inflation is significant. Global supply chains have struggled to deal with the volume of goods that have hit international ports and shipping networks as demand has strongly rebounded. Ongoing policy-localised lockdowns in China have caused further disruptions at ports. 
And of course, the recent illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia has caused volatility in global energy and food markets and pushed inflation rates to even higher levels. I've heard a great deal recently about the impact of government spending on inflation. We do need to be careful with what we spend, make sure that it's value for money and targeted to where it can make a difference. We did this through COVID with our health and economic response, and we continue to do it today. There were and are no costless decisions. Doing less would have seen unemployment grow or put people's health at risk. It's a balance and it's one that I think we got about right. We cannot control the global drivers of inflation, but we can control how we respond to it. The actions we've taken to date have been targeted towards those most affected by the types of inflation we've been seeing. Low and middle income households have been supported by a range of income support measures that came into effect on the 1st of April this year. We've also taken action to alleviate the broader impacts of higher fuel prices by cutting fuel excise duty and halving the price of public transport to make that option more attractive for New Zealanders. Looking forward, we need to be conscious of the fact that the economy is experiencing capacity constraints. Skilled labour is scarce in a range of areas, and many businesses who a short time ago were wondering if they would survive are now wondering where they'll find the workers to meet their current demand. Fiscal policy needs to be set with these conditions in mind, and it will be. The spending that we provided to support the economy through COVID-19 was time limited. Government spending as a percentage of GDP is actually about the same as it was after the GFC, and it's actually set to reduce over the coming years. But what we must not do while dealing with the pressures of the here and now is put off dealing with long-term challenges. If we decided against reforming our health system, we would not see lower petrol prices. We'd just have high petrol prices and a health system that's not working. Too often the New Zealand economy has been rung along these lines. Investment has been turned on and off in response to short-term considerations, resulting in a long series of chain reactions, delaying planning decisions, business case development, workforce recruitment and investment in sector capacity. I don't believe that that approach has served our current needs, and I certainly don't think it's adequate for our future needs. Whether it's addressing our long-standing productivity gap with other advanced countries, addressing the housing crisis or fixing our planning or three waters systems, a short-term, hands-off approach isn't going to cut it. Budget 2022 does mark a move past the crisis budgets of COVID to a new normal. We will bring the stability and certainty of fiscal rules but also take the lessons of COVID to take on the big challenges and opportunities and address the shortcomings and the inequities of the old normal. My vision for our economic future can be summed up in one sentence. I want a high wage, low emissions economy that gives economic security in good times and bad. The building blocks to reach that goal are being put in place. Last week, I announced the new fiscal rules that will guide us over the future budgets. This is the really exciting bit in the speech. The first is that we will, on average, run an Obergel surplus of between 0 and 2 per cent of GDP. Alongside that, we have set a net debt ceiling of 30 per cent of GDP using a more comparable and accurate measure of our debt. The underlying idea behind these changes is actually quite simple. We will continue to pay for our current spending through current revenue, but we'll use the debt ceiling to buffer us against economic shocks, and it will give us more room to make infrastructure investments, investments that will enhance our productivity, help us meet the challenge of climate change, and are of high quality. It also makes sense for us to spread the cost of these investments over time. And there is no shortage of things to do when it comes to infrastructure. Last week, the Infrastructure Commission released Rotaki Hananana o Aotearoa, the 30-year New Zealand infrastructure strategy. The report not only highlighted the infrastructure deficit, which has been building up over previous decades, but also set out the need to comprehensively change the way in which we plan, deliver and maintain our infrastructure. We all know the real-life impact of failing to invest enough in an, or in a, an efficient way. It's the congestion on our roads, it's the broken pipes, Andy, it's the poor quality of our hospitals and schools. We now have the strategy, the pipeline of work and the funding to start to address that deficit. 
In last year's budget, we outlined $57 billion worth of capital spending over the next five years to take this on. And in this budget, we will make use of the multi-year capital allowance to add to that. Dealing with our infrastructure deficit is only part of addressing our decades-long productivity challenge and getting to a higher wage economy. The government is focused on lifting our research, development and innovation performance and on diversifying who we trade with and what we're able to offer them. We want to support businesses to access new markets, to raise the capital they need and to help provide the skilled workforce that will move them forward. This includes the work we've been doing on industry transformation plans, the Regional Strategic Partnership Fund and the work we've been doing to lift productivity through the Digital Boost Programme. I'm immensely proud of the work we've done to lift skills and provide training opportunities. More than 190,000 people have benefited from our free apprenticeships, targeted trade training and employment programmes. And just this week we announced the extension of the Apprenticeship Boost Programme through to the end of 2022 to enable a further 38, 23, sorry, to enable a further 38,000 apprentices to finish their on-the-job training. We need to do more to draw upon global sources of knowledge and to attract skills and investment to New Zealand in a way that benefits everyone involved. We have been through an extraordinary period in which inward migration has been heavily constrained due to public health requirements. As the Prime Minister announced yesterday, our immigration rebalance will reopen our borders to inward migration, but in a way that embodies the objectives of our government. A green list will, be, will provide a streamlined pathway for residency for workers with skills that are in high demand. This approach will enable us to support the development of high value industries and to alleviate some of the supply constraints that are present in areas such as construction. At the same time, we'll be working with some industries via sector agreements to help them transition away from a reliance on low wage international workers. This approach recognises that industries will not be able to transform overnight and that some sectors are still feeling the effects of COVID-19. But the direction that we're setting out is clear. Where a shortage of skilled labour is a barrier to economic development, then there is a place for immigration to lift our economic performance. But we do not intend to return to the level of immigration that we saw throughout the previous decade or to the level of dependence on temporary migration that we saw in some sectors. We have good examples where a partnership approach with business can help to make sure that everyone is pushing in the same direction and Budget 2022 will very much build on this approach. On Monday, we will release our emissions reduction plan and the funding to back that up through the first allocations from our Climate Emergency Response Fund. That fund has been created by recycling all of the revenue from the emissions trading scheme directly to emissions reductions initiatives. Dealing with climate change is something that we need to get right and get right now. We all know the environmental imperative that we're facing, but there is also a real risk that if we drag our feet on emissions reductions, we face the possibility of the world moving on from the sorts of things that New Zealand is currently a world leader in producing. Every country in the world will have to change the way in which it meets the needs of its people in the face of climate change. This is a challenge but it is also an extraordinary opportunity for New Zealand. There are areas such as hydrogen, renewable energy, wood processing, agri-tech, where we can and do lead the world and we will create the high jobs that we need. We will partner with businesses to support them in making the transition toward low emissions technologies and work with sectors with more hard to abate emissions to develop more sustainable ways of operating. We will also provide support to lower emissions alternatives to make them accessible to a greater number of households. We can no longer put off meaningful action on climate change. The emissions reductions plans that we have created are ambitious, but they're also achievable, and we will meet the tasks set for us in our emissions budgets. Taking action on climate change is also a matter of economic security. Our economy is less reliant on fossil fuels than it once was, and the areas where the Ukraine crisis is hurting us are the areas where we've made less progress in decarbonisation, such as our private transport fleet. Increasing the uptake of low emissions vehicles will help us meet our emissions budget, but it also softens the blow on households the next time we see a global energy crisis. 
Economic security also comes from having strong public services. As I've signalled previously, a key focus of Budget 2022 will be on our health system. The health of our people is central to our wellbeing approach. When people don't get the care that they need, it affects all aspects of their life. And for many years now, New Zealanders have not received the outcomes that they deserve from their health system. The quality of health care and the availability of specialists differs from region to region. The system is fragmented and inefficient, with management structures too often getting in the way of the best approach to care. Prioritising issues at a national level, which we had to do with COVID, is extremely difficult working across 20 DHBs. Long-term planning in our system is inadequate, and we continue to see large inequities in health outcomes for Māori and Pacific peoples. New Zealand has also underinvested in its healthcare system with predictable outcomes. Part of this is actually due to the lack of financial control and mixed levels of financial capability that are characteristic of the DHB system. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that the culture of DHB deficits is a direct result of the chronic underfunding of the health budget. Budget 2022 will be about health. It will be about setting up a national health system that can meet the needs of our nation. It will be about setting up the infrastructure that will direct the attention of our health workforce to where the need for care is greatest, not to the vagaries our current structures direct them to. To get this right, we also need the workers that our system needs. In addition to training those we have here, the Greenlist process will prioritise and provide a residency pathway for a range of occupations that are in critical need – nurses, clinical psychologists, medical technicians and a range of specialist occupation. Getting the foundation of our health system right will require sustained investment. Budget 2022 will lay the groundwork for that change. Health will move to a multi-year funding track, initially through a two-year transitional investment before moving to three-year budgets from 2024-25. This reform will provide the certainty as needed for the system to plan for our long-term health priorities. To conclude, these have been an extraordinary past couple of years for everyone. As a country, we should be proud of how we have responded. But now we need to take that pride and the lessons that we have learned and put them to work on shaping our new normal. Uncertainty and volatility are part of the new normal, but so is a New Zealand economy that is the envy of many in the world. We are in a strong position to weather the storm of global inflation and build that high-wage, low-emissions economy that provides security for all New Zealanders in good and tough times. At every budget, there's a balance to strike. Get the basics right, do what's right for current and future generations, and secure a better tomorrow. It's a balance that we've struck before, and it's one that I believe we'll do again in this budget. Thank you for listening today, and I look forward to your questions. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Is that on? Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm Raphael Hilburn, and I'm representing the Wellington Pacifica Business Network, and it's my job to uh, moderate the question time. So uh, I think um, there's a couple of roving mics here, um, but one of the key messages that I, I think that we can take away from your speech is a commitment to long-term thinking um, in the portfolio and how we address these um, systemic issues in the economy and, and public services and so forth. But um, on the short term, um, <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, our optimistic friends at the BNZ are expecting growth to stall next year uh, with the real risk of a recession because of some of the things you've talked about, the su supply side shocks, labour shortages, supply chain woes, rising costs of food, fuel and other imports. What's Treasury's view and what's your messages uh, to businesses that are facing these pressures? Yeah, thanks, Raf. Uh, you know the old uh, joke that if you put 10 economists in the room, you'll get 13 opinions. And um, uh, there's certainly a range of views among economists at the moment about where we're heading, whether it's the so-called soft landing or the hard landing. 
And I think that is reflective of, of the fact that we live in such uncertain and volatile times. We continue to receive forecasts that tell us that this is an inflation spike and it will start to come down in the second half of this year. But that doesn't stop the impacts of it rolling on. And obviously, we, you know, with the actions that the Reserve Bank's taking from a monetary policy point of view, with interest rates coming up, you do have the, the potential makings of the kind of outcome that Stephen and his crew at the BNZ are forecasting. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we've got to make sure that our investments in the budget are careful, uh, that we continue to, to get the balance right between keeping a lid on debt, but making sure that we're in a position to invest where it's needed and when it's needed. I think probably the big difference when I look at the New Zealand economy compared to one or two others around the world as to how they're going to manage the way through this is that we come into this with such low unemployment. And that is the buffer in terms of what happens for people. People have got job security, um, there's room in our economy to keep investing. Um, we continue to see you know, strong interest in the economy from offshore as well. Uh, in terms of foreign investment. So, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable that the underpinnings of our economy are strong. Uh, for businesses, if to come to that part of your question, this has been such a tough couple of years to now throw on top of what's happened in COVID, um, the uncertainty that's driven by this massive supply shock. Uh, it is tough, but I think New Zealand businesses have shown a remarkable level of resilience. And Paul and I were just chatting at the table before. You've got a couple of options here. You can kind of wallow in, in the anxiety, or you can move forward and say, we've got good people, we've got great products and services, and we've got an ability to sell those into the world, let's, let's do it. And I think that's the attitude I hear from most businesses. They want to get on with it. What they can be assured is the government will continue to be there uh, and support them. Thanks, Minister. Now, as far as I'm aware, Max Key's not here, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, does anyone want to take his place and ask the Minister some tough questions? Um, yeah, Brad's over there, he's always got one. Brad, you beat me to it. <laughs> um, kia ora, Minister. Thank you. I, you've talked a lot about the different priorities but also the tough choices that are facing government and the limited choices in effect because there's not an, an endless pot of money. How's the government's thinking changing around uh, the value for money that you talked about and extracting uh, sort of as much resource as you can from every dollar? I, is that changing? Is there a different focus or is, is there more of the same um, still focus but, but not necessarily changing? Yeah, look, the value for money approach is part of every budget, and so at that level, you know, at one level, you're right, Brad, it, it doesn't change. Every, every time a new proposal comes up, we assess it for that. One of the things we've done is a series of expenditure reviews of a number of large government agencies, and in this budget, um, you'll see uh, something that we've done as a pilot which is the creation of two clusters of, of portfolios of, of ministers and agencies, um, one in the justice area and one in the natural resources area. And what we did there was ask agencies who work in those areas to come together. So in the justice area, it's justice, corrections, courts, um, police, um, SFO, um, attorney general, crown law, ask them to come together we did a full expenditure review of the agencies, and on the basis of that, they then produced four priorities, a set of proposals, and they're now funded for three years. So they don't have to come back in each budget. This is what they're going to do. It gives them the certainty to be able to employ people, to be able to do, enter into contracts. And that process has been great because it's not only brought together that value for money exercise, but it's also given us the ability to have far better long-term planning and I, I know it's a Wellington audience so you all appreciate the detailed analysis of the Public Finance Act uh, but it is really important that we start to, to look far more long term in the structures of what we do. When I became the Minister of Finance we had an annualised capital allowance. It was hopeless for being able to do the kind of investment that we need. We now have a multi-year one. We've got multi-year funding for health multi-year funding for climate, and now multi-year funding for these uh, two agencies. So I think you can see the direction of travel. It's more important than ever, if you're giving multi-year funding, to have that value for money exercise right at the beginning. So, and that's what we did in the clusters. So you will see some of that change, and over time I'd like to see that roll out further. Great to have a bit of public finance first thing in the morning. No one's had enough coffee for that. Hi. What are the government's 
estimates around the inflationary impacts of, of not only fair pay agreements but also the social insurance scheme? A good question. So in terms of the inflationary impacts um, of, of both of those schemes, I think in the grand scheme of, uh, of the government's books and the New Zealand economy, the answer is not huge. But uh, in detail, the fair pay agreements, I think, are a really important exercise for the government in making sure we set out the expectations that we have that we don't want to race to the bottom on wages. And the point that I was making earlier on in my, in my comments was that uh, a high wage economy is one that's going to benefit everybody. The fair pay agreements are very similar to the things you'd see in Australia and elsewhere about where we can set minimum standards. Um, we've already indicated we're likely, you know, not likely to see a huge rush of them, you know, perhaps two, a couple first off the bat and then a couple more after that. And they'll be in the areas where I think all New Zealanders have benefited from essential workers. You know, I think areas like bus drivers or supermarkets or security guards, where we need to make sure that we don't we don't see that race to the bottom on pay. And as I say, internationally they're very common. On the New Zealand income uh, insurance scheme, the so-called social insurance scheme, this really is one of the lessons of COVID. And it's not just a lesson of COVID, it's also a lesson of what happened after the Canterbury earthquakes where the previous government had to put in place some kind of ad hoc scheme when there was a very immediate economic shock and people were losing their jobs. And New Zealand is one of, I think, only two countries in the world that doesn't have some form of social unemployment insurance scheme. So we sat down with Business New Zealand and the Council of Trade Unions and designed that scheme together. So it's a tripartite scheme and it is designed to give New Zealanders that kind of stability uh, for their incomes. However, it takes a lot of designing and a lot of work, and the earliest it would possibly be implemented would be the end of 2023. So in terms of the current inflation spike that we're having, uh, it won't be having an impact on that. But it is a, a really important step forward for us, and I'm very grateful to both Business New Zealand and the CTU for the work that they've done with us on it. Good morning, Minister. Good day, Kenny Clark. Um, couldn't let you get away in front of a Wellington audience without a question about let's get Wally moving. Um, you talked about infrastructure investment and um, what might be coming up in the budget. So is there anything here for this morning's audience about a push or a progress or just something to give people a sense that things are happening? Because um, it's, yeah, been a long time. <laughs> it has been a long time, Kenny, hasn't it? Uh, look. Let's Get Wellington Moving is making progress now, and you would have seen the announcements that have been made both about the work around the Keys and the ongoing work on the Golden Mile. The big kahuna project of Let's Get Wellington Moving is what we do with mass rapid transit, and there'll be no doubt more to say about that very soon uh, from all of the partners involved. There's been a consultation process that many Wellingtonians have contributed to, uh, and it is important that we get that right, and that we get that right for the long term. In terms of the money that goes with that, you've already heard from the Crown um, that we're committed to our contribution to that. Um, the two councils signed up to it. They now have to work through uh, the, their funding systems and how we get there. One of the really important things that we can do, though, is make sure that the tools are available to the Crown, uh, to the council, sorry, to be able to do what we're asking of them. And uh, certainly on Monday in the emissions reduction plan, you'll hear a bit more about the kinds of tools that we think can be available uh, and the contribution that we're looking for councils to be able to make that, that we provide those tools. So you certainly see those advances there. But overall, from, from the government's perspective, Wellington's transport needs are ones that we know have not been met in decades past and that we have to do a lot better uh, to help meet them and the, the Crown certainly continues to be here and ready with the money that we've allocated for it. Hi, I'm Amanda Little from Export New Zealand in Hawke's Bay, so I'm here representing the regions. We're delighted to hear about the health because we, our hospital needs a bit more funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, just from an exporter's perspective, what do I tell exporters in Hawke's Bay who are really hurting with you know, immigration problems, they just haven't got enough workers at all ends of the scale, um, fair paid agreement, all those kind of things. What, what do I say to them on Monday? What, yeah. what do I, because they're waiting to hear what I have to say. Uh, firstly, on Monday, you should tell them to keep watching through the week to the budget on Thursday. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, look, as I said in the speech, it has been a really tough time, and it's the reason why 
we stepped up, we provided the support we did through COVID, through things like wage subsidy and, 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 the, and the various other business support payments that we did. And what you can tell uh, those people is that the government will continue to be here to support them. As exporters in particular, we've carried on with the air freight subsidy scheme that's kept planes coming in and out of New Zealand. We're now in a position to be able to transition away from that because the borders are opening up. And the big thing for, and don't worry, um, your, your representatives in Parliament make this very clear to us very often, from, from a workforce point of view, um, we now have the immigration rebalance that actually employers will, through the accredited employer scheme, be able to bring people in far more easily. Um, we have a recognition that in some of those critical export sectors you need the ability to be able to move more quickly, more effectively and efficiently through the system and that's what we're trying to design. That if you're part of that scheme, there are commitments around the number of days it'll take to be able to get you to a point where you can just bring people in. So I really would recommend engage with that, talk to us about any aspects of it that are concerning to you. But we obviously recognise uh, the, the massive impact, particularly in the horticulture industry, around what's happened there. More broadly than that, um, as I indicated in the speech, the budget will have a focus around what we can do to build that higher wage economy to be more productive. Skills is a big part of that, access to a skilled workforce is a big part of that, but so is making sure that businesses can meet their capital needs. And I often hear uh, statements that the world's awash with capital, but that doesn't always find its way to small and medium enterprises who are the lifeblood of the New Zealand economy. We don't always get the technology and the adaption to the technology directly to those businesses. So there is certainly in the budget going to be a focus on what we can do to support businesses and businesses in the regions. So if they can survive from Monday to Thursday, um, that would be a good thing.